It's the 5th of November uh, here in Singapore, 3 p.m. Uh, welcome to our DBS Macro Insights live stream for the month of November, a rather special one entitled U.S. Elections and Implications. We will talk mostly today about the ongoing results that are being counted and what it means both for markets and uh, Asia. Uh, we have received a number of very good questions and we will uh, cap off the call by addressing them one by one. Hopefully some of them will be addressed already during the course of the discussion. So let's get right down to it. Um, slide two is the outline of the presentation. As you can see that before I actually get into the US elections, I will talk a little bit about the state of the COVID-19 pandemic, because as far as short-term implications on global lives and livelihoods, actually it has far greater bearing than anything that might come out of the US elections. Um, US elections are important, consequential, but let's also get a good sense of you know, where the state of the pandemic is. So that would be the first thing. And uh, slide four um, would be the first uh, visualization. And those of you who listen to our live stream or watch the slideshow will be familiar with the four charts that I have to, I'll be showing you now. Uh, they are basically updated through yesterday. And for a while, especially in the months of September and October, when I did the live stream, the charts were becoming a bit predictable. Uh, in the case of uh, non-Asia large economies, uh, what we had seen was, you know, US and Brazil were looking bad, but the other cases, there were some successful mitigation. So countries like France and Germany had flattened out. They had a fairly decent summer. Spain was looking pretty decent as well. Uh, that's all behind us, unfortunately. We are stepping into the fall season and into the winter uh, with uh, resurgence just about everywhere. I suppose in this chart that I'm showing you right now, the only country where there isn't a major uptick would be Russia. Um, but the level wise, it's not very comfortable, but everywhere else, whether you look at Italy or France or Germany or Spain, and of course the usual suspects combo of US and Brazil, uh, curves haven't shown uh, flattening, except US and Brazil, you could say that they're sort of following trend that they haven't really changed that much. Whereas in other cases, things have actually turned worse. Uh, I will come back to these countries with a different set of visualization momentarily, but on slide five, we will basically look at the same data and this time in the context of Asia, uh, which shows you we're on a, almost like a different planet, if you will. Uh, the only country that looks even remotely like a country that is showing some resurgence would be Malaysia. Everywhere else, there's telltale signs of curve flattening, even the really bad cases, India, Philippines, and Indonesia, where there's still considerable concern about how this pandemic pans out, questions about testing, and all sorts of stuff. Uh, from a daily report perspective, from hospital systems coming under pressure, there isn't a whole lot going on. So we don't have to worry that much about that story. Uh, but, uh, and of course, you know, you have these really heroic cases uh, in Asia, and that would include uh, the usual suspects, which would be Vietnam and Taiwan and Thailand and South Korea and China, where curves have really flattened and there's been very, very strong mitigation there. Uh, even a country like Singapore, which we'll revisit in a second, uh, remains on a per capita basis, one of the highest in the uh, region um, on a flow basis, of course, has uh, suppressed the outbreak as good as just about anybody in the world. Uh, so alternative visualization, starting with slide six. Uh, so this is the same data that we saw for non-Asia large countries, uh, but this time uh, stock and flow comparison and the horizontal axis, we have the total number of confirmed cases on the vertical axis, we have the cumulative five-day uh, number. Uh, so, you know, in the, and it's in log scale. So as you can see in the case of the US, where in the last five days, the cumulative number is close to half a million, uh, 440,000 or something like that. And yesterday it was 100,000, just in one day. So the US, after showing some improvement through the month of, uh, uh, September, October, uh, or till mid-October has now seen a major resurgence uh, and the last few days have been really terrible. So it doesn't really matter who's gonna be the president out of this election. Uh, as soon as the dust settles, uh, which hopefully will be soon, um, focus will go back to dealing with the pandemic, uh, whether you're in the uh, pandemic denial camp or pandemic uh, mitigation camp, 
got to deal with this uh, because things are becoming pretty bad. Um, I have a relative. My niece is a doctor in the state of Iowa. Yesterday in her clinic, test positivity was 40 percent. That, that tells you um, how widespread the pandemic is, even in these states. Uh, I know friends who have kids in school in Utah. You would again think remote areas, mountainous, open spaces, there wouldn't be that much of an outbreak, huge, huge outbreak. So it's not just concentrated in the urban centers in the East and the West, it's spreading all over the country and health systems are coming under pressure. This election related drama has sort of pushed the, uh, has pushed the COVID story somewhat down. It'll come back very, very quickly, especially when you look at what's happening in Europe. I mean, look at this. Um, the uh, uh, Red line in the case of Brazil, notwithstanding everywhere else, you know, the blue dotted line, France, the orange line, UK, uh, red dotted line, Germany, um, and uh, Turkey, and so on. Uh, we are seeing, you know, steady rise in cases and renewed lockdown measures. So uh, it is an unfortunate sort of set of circumstances that even countries that had been initially quite successful in suppressing the virus seems to have let their guards down, and we are beginning to see a big resurgence. Again, when you look at the exact same set of data in the context of Asia, it does look like we're on a different planet. Uh, here, even the worrisome countries like India, Indonesia, and Philippines are seeing uh, some dip in the daily infection rates. Uh, and then you have the cases like China, Singapore, uh, Vietnam, uh, Taiwan, which are now basically down to one or two uh, cases on a five-day basis, or at most five cases on a daily basis. Um, China, you once in a while hear a little bit of a pickup here and there, but it's really not making any difference. They are by and large, you know, way ahead of everybody else. We saw a bit of a scare in the context of uh, Korea for just a brief while. That seemed to be behind us again. Uh, Hong Kong had a bit of a scare, but they've also brought that down substantially. The only worrisome case from a trajectory perspective is Malaysia right now, where there's been a bit of a resurgence. But beyond that, uh, Asia does look pretty good. Okay. Enough about the pandemic. Uh, we will keep on talking and writing about the pipeline of antivirals and vaccines. Uh, and then, of course, we will uh, examine them in greater detail in the December live stream. But for the time being, uh, let's move on and focus on the US elections. Uh, so, slide eight, uh, it tells you that, okay, we we'll first look at the US elections and where the numbers are. And we picked a very, very good time. Uh, election results are more or less frozen at this point. It's at uh, 2 a.m. Eastern time in the U.S. Uh, nothing else is getting counted, really. So um, whatever data that I show you is not in danger of becoming outdated, at least through the course of this hour, which makes you feel very good. Uh, and then we will talk about the implication of that for U.S. policy, for markets in Asia, and then we'll get to your questions. All right, slide nine and 10 would be sort of revisiting some of the things we said a month ago. So this was our slide on October 5 and slide nine, you can see that there is little confidence in polls, although the polls were suggesting that there was a strong, very, very strong likelihood of a Biden victory. Uh, people were uh, scarred by what had happened in 2016 and were not paying too much attention. I think the market was actually paying quite a bit of attention to the polls and market pricing seemed to be suggesting that the polls would be right. And that clearly has not been quite the case. Uh, but then there was the other issue that we flagged, that there would be a narrow outcome regardless of what the polls are saying, and that can get dragged through the course for weeks, if not months. Unfortunately, it's sort of panning out that way. Uh, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but the risks are there. And then controversy around absentee ballot was one fear, civil unrest was another fear, and the worst case scenario was a constitutional crisis if uh, Trump calls the results from a popular vote illegitimate, uh, which of course, you know, we already know that he's gonna be losing by a large margin and resource to state legislators and courts to force a different outcome. You are already seeing that playing out. I think it really depends on how many electoral votes gets called for Biden at the end of the day that uh, would or would not add a lot of energy to these measures. But clearly, the risk of a constitutional crisis, the risk of a civil unrest, controversy or an absentee ballot are very much on the cards even now. So I'm glad that we had flagged those risks a month ago and they remain as valid today as they were a month ago. Slide 10 shows you the other thing that we were forecasting or, or flagging in last month's uh, a live stream was that polls and betting markets are suggesting a likely Biden win. That probability, by the way, a month ago, 67, he headed toward 85 um, coming into the election. So markets were um, beginning to price in quite resoundingly what the polls were saying. Um, and uh, markets were smart about the Senate victory, though. There wasn't that much of a pricing of blue wave, in my view, because if that were the case, I think we would have seen far stronger curve 
steepening and uh, and risk of uh, you know energy companies selling off because they would have been expecting strong regulation from a blue wave uh, uh, democratic push uh, and also we probably would have seen uh, consumption indicators as well as uh, corporate uh, earnings forecasts and those sort of things getting affected because people would have been pricing in higher income taxes and higher corporate taxes. That didn't really happen. So I don't think the market was fully buying the idea of a Senate victory for the Democrats. It may happen. Looks very, very unlikely. Uh, I'll talk about that momentarily. Uh, and then, uh, like I said, they were not necessarily pricing in major progressive measures. Um, but at that point, it did seem like the probability of Biden presidency plus a Democratic Senate was rising. And like I said, we'll come back to that. And that there was this other possibility that nothing would be resolved the day after the elections, and that's where we stand. We still haven't fully resolved the Senate outcome, and we haven't at all resolved the presidential outcome. All right, slide 10, where the numbers are right now. So the first two columns uh, here are what the polls were flagging a month ago. And now, uh, I've picked this up from 1 p.m. Singapore time, so that was two hours ago, nothing has changed. I just checked it before I started this call. These numbers are the current numbers. So what do you see? Uh, nationally, uh, Biden had about an 8% lead. Well, that's the case. He's getting about two, two and a half percent more than Trump, still pretty impressive. Um, and then uh, nationally, Arizona, you know, at that time, or swing states was supposed to be like a 3% gap narrower than that. Michigan was supposed to be like a landslide 8% gap. Michigan has been called for Biden, but much, much narrower. Uh, and for a long time, Trump was leading Michigan. In Florida, Biden had a 3% lead. He lost by more than 3%. So what a huge swing and how wrong were the polls in Florida. Uh, in Ohio, it was considered a toss-up. It was not even close to a toss-up. Trump won it by a resounding 8%. Uh, so you can see that Florida and Ohio, the polls were absolutely wrong. In Minnesota, again, Trump uh, was supposed to lose by a landslide. It has turned out to be closer, and still it's been called for Biden and seems a decent margin, uh, but, uh, but not like an absolute landslide. Similarly, in Pennsylvania, till the very end, it seemed like Biden had like a five, six percentage advantage. As of now, we still can't call it. And in fact, Biden is trailing, uh, and there's lots of technical discussion about the remaining votes and which counties they're from and how blue they are, all of those uh, is suggesting that to some pollsters that you know he might still pick up Pennsylvania, but then there are some pollsters who believe that Pennsylvania is still leaning uh, red uh, and, and it's too close to call. Uh, then there's Wisconsin, where again, Biden had a massive lead in the polls, but won by less than 1%. So that again tells you that the errors have been one way. Uh, by and large, uh, Trump has done much better than expected. Uh, and uh, despite all the lessons of the 2016 poll, less educated voters tend to tilt toward Trump, so therefore we need to account for that. Uh, in the past, there used to be a lot of undecided voters. Now there are a lot less, so therefore more conviction in the poll. So all those factors were there. I've been flagging them over and over again. Turns out still a lot of one-sided errors uh, as far as the polls are concerned, and these pollsters are not picking up the substantial support for uh, Donald Trump. Uh, yeah, for whatever reason, you will see analysis and postmortem for months, if not years to come, of you know why is this happening, but it's happening again. All right, so a month ago, I had all these states on my screen, but I did not have Georgia and Nevada. I did not think this could be that close. So there, the thing are going in the other direction, where uh, in Georgia, Biden has closed the gap substantially against Donald Trump, and um, uh, we still don't have a final count there, but uh, it uh, and and. Some are calling it's uh, you know too close to call. Some are calling it's leaning blue or leaning red. So we'll see where it all ends up. But as of now, uh, I think my data is slightly outdated. I said 49.1 Biden, 49.7. I'm looking at the screen right now. It's more like 49.1, 49.6. So a 0.5 percentage point difference between Biden and Trump in Georgia. That amounts to about 23,000 votes, so or 22 and a half thousand votes. Very very tight. Uh, we'll see what happens there. And then there's Nevada, where by, I think most pollsters are saying it's leaning toward Biden. He is up 49.3 to 48.7. The problem in Nevada is that they will keep counting for a few more days. Uh, and uh, I don't think anybody will have the courage to call Nevada one way or the other till all the votes are counted. Uh, so we'll, we'll have to sort of keep our fingers crossed uh, in there. OK, so that's where the picture is. It's a bit of a mixed picture. Uh, I think a lot of pollsters are right now thinking that given how 
Biden is somewhere in the range of 264 electoral votes, and he's leaning in uh, Arizona and Nevada that he will be winning the election. I sort of agree with that, but I will not be shocked at all if things turn around in a couple of days' time. I'm humbled by all these data volatility, so I'm not going to put all my eggs in the basket and proclaim that Biden is going to be the president. But, uh, but it does look like that way, at least as of now. All right, uh, let's move on to start sort of taking stock. So page 12 shows a very distressing chart. It shows that US firearm background checks, which is a proxy for number of firearm sales that skyrocketed this year. I think this data is all the way through September and was rising at a rate of 60, 45 to 60% on a year-on-year -year basis. Um, harbing up for bad things. If indeed, you know, there is civil unrest, the country is more weaponized than ever before. Um, and uh, so what are the major sort of, you know, takeaways? One is, as I said earlier, that outperformed the polls considerably, uh, outperforming the polls considerably by Donald Trump, and which is casting doubt on pollsters yet again. It is unlikely the Democrats are going to take control of the Senate, but it is not completely over. I'll come to this in a moment. <laughs> moment. Uh, it is likely that Democrats will retain their majority in the House of Representatives, but will not be making substantial gains at all. Uh, there's been a lot of disappointment in the House races. Many female candidates who won for the first time in the 2018 blue wave have lost this time to female Republican candidates. So the Republican Party has also re-strategized and succeeded this year, um, despite all of the talk of a blue wave in the House. It hasn't worked out that well. So all in all, even if Biden were to become president, it's been disappointing for the Democrats. Uh, polls have been wrong on the presidential election outcome. Margins have been much narrower. Senate has not swung blue as readily as they expected, despite huge amount of investment in states like Georgia and North Carolina uh, and elsewhere. Um, and then there would be, you know, question marks about, you know, what, what happened to the Senate. Uh, and then on the House also, a lot of resources invested, a lot of enthusiasm, but it's actually turned out to be tilting toward a Republican as far as net uh, gains or losses are concerned. What does this tell you? This tells you that there is no clear shift in perspective support. The national for sure in the U.S. is deep, and the country is split in the middle, and these elections are more and more coin tosses. And one way or the other does not tell you anything about what the overall will of the people is in that nation, and therefore enormous amount of time, energy, money is being spent to till that coin toss in one direction or the other, but even then, there is no mandate. There is no clear mandate. And this is a problem for a democracy in getting things done you know, on a durable basis. If it's a coin toss election every four years or even every two years in the House uh, and the Senate, then what does it tell you? It tells you that things will swing one way or the other and strong candidates will come and change things through executive route or sometimes they'll have the legislature on their side, but then it would not be durable because then the coin toss will go the other direction and all of those things would be undone. As we have seen uh, how the legacy of Obama presidency was largely uh, undone by Trump with his tax cuts, deregulation, and uh, to, to a large you know, fiscal uh, easing long before there was a need for that, uh, energy-related matters, uh, trade-related matters, everything. Uh, and let's not forget healthcare. Uh, and now, of course, if Biden were to come, we will expect some of the legacies of Trump being uh, undone, although, there's not that much of a mandate one way or the other. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we have to keep worrying that uh, the uh, litigation risk, civil unrest risk are still substantial. They're not going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, and then uh, there is uh, the issue of uh, the pandemic. Uh, if you think about it, 2020, Trump has virtually gotten no breaks. The economy was doing well. The pandemic came. The recession came. That all undid for him. And I think there are a lot of Trump supporters who don't blame Trump for that. They basically blame the disease, the, the pandemic, or they blame China for that. Uh, so that uh, hurt Trump to some extent. But I think the 2017 2019 economic outcome, where small businesses prospered, um, although investments did falter a bit in 2018, 2019, but still the tax cuts uh, made Trump popular among his base and perhaps also in the margin. Uh, and he, people did not, those who supported him, did not penalize him for the missteps of 2020, whether it was the pandemic or the election. So um, uh, it's, it's uh, remarkable that uh, despite not getting any breaks and having had major negative revelations, whether it was around the tax issue or uh, the um, 
you know, issues related to race relations, inequality, which all should be hurting Trump. And despite that, it's turned out to be such a coin toss election. Uh, okay, I said earlier that I will flag the fact that the Senate, uh, although I had been saying earlier that it's basically all but gone, it's there's a small chance that the Senate could be 50-50 uh, for the Democrats. How is it that? So right now, it's 48-48. Uh, and the areas where the Democrats have a chance uh, are basically the two Senate seats in the state of Georgia. Uh, there will be a runoff there, one of them. And the other one, which was Senator David Perdue, his lead over his opponent is now down to 0.1% uh, or so. So it's like 50.1 uh, on his side. Uh, if that falls below 50, they will call for a runoff election in the state of Georgia for will produce seat. Uh, and therefore, there is going to be two uh, runoff elections in Georgia in January. And if the Democrats, by energized campaigning or whatever, were to win both of them, uh, then the Senate would turn 50-50. Uh, and then, of course, the vice president would have the casting vote, which in the case of a Biden presidency would be Kamala Harris. And then there will be chance to get some legislation done. Uh, I don't think anybody is pricing that in at all right now. So keep that in mind, unlikely, but not impossible. Let's move on to slide 13. And this is where I sort of you know, expand on that point that I made earlier, that there are chronic problems in the conduct of democracy in the US right now. This near parity in party competition has been going on for decades. Uh, and without it swinging one direction or the other, uh, the country will remain divided on civilizational matters, you know, what to do as far as climate change is concerned, what to do about inequality. There is no consensus and the country will remain divided and therefore you will not see um, lasting adjustment on policy matters. Fiscal policy will be loose under one regime, tight on the other, climate change related issues would be embraced by one party, then repeated by the other, healthcare, same story, judiciary reform, same story. Um, there is also this powerful demographic shift going on in the country. The country is becoming less white. There are a lot of young voters, unlike say Europe or China or Japan, demographics are still favorable in the US. So you would think that the young guard would assert themselves on issues like inequality, climate change, healthcare, which are big for them, would become part of national discourse, but it hasn't really happened yet. Old guard still has a huge amount of control, lobby from the medical community and Wall Street and so on are, remain very, very strong. So things are changing, but not fast enough in the US. Uh, we'll have to wait for a few more years to look at the demographics uh, dynamic and how that influences policy, but we're not quite there yet, which is frustrating. All right, moving on to slide 14, uh, we will now sort of touch on the issues related to implication for US policy. I've already highlighted some of those already, uh, but uh, let's uh, flesh that out just a little more now on slide 15. Um, stimulus. The big discussion leading into the election was uh, what kind of stimulus, so the quantity of the stimulus, is it two trillion, two and a half trillion, one and a half trillion, the composition, does it come on payroll tax relief, does it come on additional expenditure on infrastructure, what sort of things to do. Um, it, the parties could not come to a conclusion, so the stimulus remained on the sideline. Uh, if we are going to have a very tight Senate outcome, uncertainty around that, if we're going to have a very, very narrow mandate with one way or the other for Trump or Biden, we're not going to go anywhere with the stimulus. So expect delays is, and also expect underwhelming size and composition of the stimulus. I think that is going to be the most likely uh, outcome going forward, unless, of course, uh, a month or two months from now, we have Biden as a president and by um, massive uh, turnout and enthusiasm, Democrats have managed to take the Senate to 50-50, but we're not there anywhere near there yet. Um, so in the coming weeks, uh, don't expect anything. Um, again, on the tax increase side, with such narrow senatorial outcome, I really can't imagine uh, the Democrats managing to push through huge increases in corporate income tax, huge increases in personal income tax, and so on. So I think that will get, again, uh, compromised to a large extent. Uh, on climate change, same story, but there the silver lining is that the states are not waiting for the signal and legislative um, direction from the center. They're going ahead with their own uh, strategies and own uh, uh, initiatives. Um, and issues like tech regulation and China, which is a very popular 
question in today's uh, Q&A session. Uh, I can't see those things changing too much. Uh, we all know that there is probably more respect for multilateralism in the Biden Democrat camp as opposed to the Trump camp, but uh, the desire to regulate tech, uh, rein in their uh, profits, uh, rein in their power, the desire to do something on the uh, issue of uh, social media type tech companies and about their uh, disclosure, privacy, and that kind of stuff, I think is uh, certainly going to be there on a bipartisan basis. Uh, might change flavor depending on who's president, but it's very much on the cards. So that to me is the basic set of policy expectation, not a whole lot to say. We are not going to get a major stimulus. We're not going to get major tax increases. Issues like climate change probably will be somewhat in the backseat uh, and issues like tech regulation and pushing on China and human rights, geopolitics will remain regardless of who the president is. Slide 16 uh, is the marker for implication for markets. So go to like slide 17 and let's start looking at the, what the market action has been so far. Well, firstly, uh, interest rates. Um, we were seeing the curve steepen uh, leading into the election. The expectation was again, maybe if there is a blue wave, there'll be a huge stimulus, be a lot of spending. Uh, in, uh, so 30 years would sell off. So the two stands, two thirties were widening. Um, that stopped in the last couple of days. Uh, there's been a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of confusion about the direction of policy. So what we've seen is a bit of a bull flattening of the curve. Uh, so what you see in this chart is not the yield curve, but the 10-year real yield. As you can see, it's been sort of picking up a bit through the months of August, September, October, but then has gone down a bit in the last couple of days, understandably. Similarly, inflation expectation, which is a five cross five break even um, uh, that uh, market observers and Fed policymakers like to use. You can see that has also dipped a little bit in the last few days to around you know 1.6% or so. Uh, so not a lot to say about that, just that, you know, markets are a bit underwhelmed by the election outcome, are not expecting things to become very uh, stimulatory, and therefore the reflation trend trade has uh, been uh, dampened to a large extent in the last 48 hours, and I think that will continue to be the case for the time being. On slide 18, we're looking at the FX markets. Uh, currency vols have actually fallen uh, in, the, in the last week or so. Uh, RMB has been rallying, uh, dollar has weakened a tad, uh, despite very bad uh, COVID numbers, uh, UK, Europe, uh, we haven't seen any major sell-off against the US dollar. Uh, so there, the reflation momentum is still there to some extent, in my view. And it actually becomes more clear when we look at slide 19, which is the uh, speculative position on the US dollar. Uh, and uh, as you can see, that the market remains fairly short the dollar. Uh, it's not as relentlessly short as it was a couple of months ago, but still uh, compared to how things were in 2018-19, the market remains substantially short. And we have not actually seen such sh overall short uh, on the US dollar side uh, in the last uh, six, seven years. Uh, so the narrative is very clear that regardless of who's president, US debt deficit will remain large. Uh, the uh, the yield will remain at their floor, yield for most securities will remain at their floor, uh, and therefore the attractiveness of the US dollar as a uh, currency, whether it's from a carry perspective or from an investment perspective, has waned on the margin. And hence, we're seeing this interest, uh, short interest in the US dollar. The uh, next thing that we're going to look at on slide 21 is the implication for Asia. Um, and oh, sorry, uh, I want to. I jumped a little bit. Uh, let's look at slide 20 before we go there. Uh, equity market. Uh, slide 20 is showing you that the market has priced out a blue wave, not expecting that, but uh, some really for Asia. Uh, but here we have basically the fixed volatility chart. Again, as you can see, uh, vols have come down a bit in the last few days. Uh, S&P, of course, has been rallying a tad in expectation, I suppose, on some degree of clarity uh, very, very soon. We'll see how good that prognostication is from the market. Uh, but as you can see, our measure of risk aversion, which is basically an S&P 500 three-month uh, skew, that is still a bit elevated. It's picked up a lot in the last uh, few days and eased a bit yesterday, but not all the way down. So there is some degree of discomfort still in the market. Okay, so that was the point that I was trying to make. Generally speaking, on the currency space, 
not a whole lot going on. On the rate space, a bit of a bull flattening. Uh, positioning is short US dollar, uh, and those convictions remain in place. Don't think they're gonna be affected by uh, expectations of a Biden win or some sort of a shock development around uh, Trump. Okay, move on. Uh, implication for Asia, slide 21, and then slide 22 is the first slide that examines the implication for Asia. So this is a short-term chart. I'll show you a long-term chart momentarily, but right now on slide 22, you are looking at the trade numbers for Asia. So this is aggregated trade number. I sort of, we do this on a PPP, GDP weighted basis. Um, and for emerging markets, so this includes everybody in Asia from China onward to Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, ASEAN countries, a whole lot. And what you see is that we have November PMI and we have October trade data. Things are moving hand in hand. Uh, PMI has surged now for the region to 53. And uh, we are seeing order books begin to fill out considerably. So the regional exports are now up to about 7% on a year on year basis. Uh, some countries are doing better than others. Singapore has seen a gangbuster number. China has been doing very well for months. So have Vietnam and uh, Thailand uh, uh, and uh, Taiwan and Korea. For the rest, also they're sort of beginning to pick up the pace. Um, so I see no trade-off between lives and livelihood. Earlier, I showed you a chart where you saw the visualization that pandemic is largely under control in Asia, with the exception of Malaysia, and you know some degree of discomfort with Thailand, Indonesia, India, but uh, uh, Philippines, Indonesia, India, but. When one looks at the rest, uh, pandemic has been managed well, and supply chains are back in form. Uh, factories are humming. There is significant external demand for whatever Asia produces, stretching from uh, clothing, apparel to electronics. Uh, significant demand, and that's showing up in the export numbers of the region. And we do expect to end 2020 on a fairly strong note after the massive collapse in the first half of this year. On slide 23, I am going to look at this issue from a longer term direction. Earlier, I told you that I don't think that tariffs are coming down anytime soon. I also don't think China-US tries to disappear even if Biden were the president. I think we all know what's likely on the China-US side if Trump were to get reelected, it would still be acrimonious. Um, but, uh, but yeah, maybe you know, with the Biden presidency, some reduced stress on trade war, some reduced stress on uh, the explosive news that we keep on seeing on immigration matters. But that won't really matter that much for Asia. Maybe on the margin, it helps countries like India and Philippines, but not a whole lot impact on the whole region across the board. But I think it's important to recognize a longer term trend. What you see in this uh, chart is US foreign direct investment positions in Asia from 2015 to 2019, and exactly the same time horizon, but also in the context of China. It's remarkable that all these years of trade war and slew of executive orders restricting uh, you know, Chinese companies from exporting to the US, uh, discouraging US companies to invest in China, all that sort of stuff have not dented the picture in a meaningful manner. In fact, in the case of Asia, you could say, well, in 2018, the US FDI position took a dip and then it's come back. You can't even say that in the context of China, which has seen a steady increase in US FDI position. So on one hand, you know, there's nonstop narrative and noise around trade war and tech war, supply chain fragmentation, companies, you know, figuring out channelized strategy. I think all of that stuff is probably true, but it's probably not that meaningful, especially when we see that American companies remain long Asia and long China and their net investment position in the region keep rising. And even in this chart, the FDI position uh, between 2015 and 2019, up very, very substantially, very robustly, and still no sign that enthusiasm of America investing in Asia is gone. I don't think that enthusiasm will wane even if Trump were to get reelected, because there are many countries in Asia that are strong allies of the US. And even if Trump gets elected and starts acting even harder against China, uh, still leaves the rest of Asia to do business with the US. So we think US investment in Asia will continue, and we still think that you know, Asia's connection with the US and reliance on the US will also remain substantial, uh, China issue notwithstanding. I'm not trying to downplay the strife between China and the US. I'm just saying that in the context of Asia, even if there's tension between China and the US and 
there is, you know, 50-50 chance of Biden occupying the White House or Trump for term two, even in all those circumstances, uh, interest and engagement with Asia uh, will not diminish as far as the U.S. is concerned. Okay, so I have, in the 35 minutes of this call, I ran through just about everything that I wanted to, because again, there's no point in prognosticating too much, uh, but the bottom line that, you know, stars have aligned somewhat for Biden is very much there, uh, but there's also no guarantee. Uh, networks have not uh, been calling the election for a while. We'll have to probably wait till tomorrow to get some clarity on Georgia, uh, or at least a few more hours, and uh, then we'll see uh, how things change. But I think if it's a very tight race, as in Biden ends up with 270 electoral votes and Trump gets 268 or something like that, uh, I think it'll be very, very contentious. And there'll be a lot of legal uh, initiatives taken by the Trump side uh, and perhaps also on the Biden side, if they feel that some things are not going their way, uh, which might require hardcore intervention. And then the whole thing becomes very explosive because uh, the mood on the street, as you saw with the gun registration data that I showed you, is uh, pretty tense and the risk of things going out of control is substantial. So let's all hope and pray none of those things happen. Uh, so, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop talking about the US now uh, in the context of Asia and go back to the Q&A where I will probably revisit some of the issues that I've seen, but also examine some of the questions that were not covered at all in my presentation so far. All right, so SAI 25 as the set of questions. There have been a few more that's come in in the last hour or so, I apologize not having them on the screen. But I think if I manage to cover this in the next 15 minutes or so, I think that would be a pretty good uh, coverage of the concerns that you uh, 400 odd listeners who are listening to this call right now. Question one, given the protectionist sentiments that have built up uh, rapidly in the US in the Trump administration, what do you think will be the trigger for the world to revert back to more open economies pre-Trump days? I hate to start the Q&A session by pouring cold water, uh, but I have to because I don't think a non-Trump government uh, would necessarily take us back to the more open economies of pre-Trump days. Those days might be just permanently behind us. Uh, mind you, Democrats have traditionally been the protectionist party. Democrats have tr traditionally been the tariff party. So Trump co-opted those views, and somehow or the other, the Republican Party did not revolt, perhaps because they rely so much on him for supporting elections. And so you sometimes wonder whether Trump represents the Republicans or Republicans represent Trump probably the latter at this point. Um, so anyway, in either of those cases, uh, the chance of going back to more economies pre-Trump is unlikely because we all know where Trump stands and we also don't think that the Democrats, as soon as they come to power, can be seen as uh, opening up markets that will subject to American workers to competition. So I think that uh, more open economies uh, will have to happen on a regional basis. So maybe the ASEAN countries and North Asia can take initiatives. It's no point in waiting for the US. Uh, there's also been some long standing trend that we have sort of started shying away from openness. If you see UNCTAD's uh, trade restriction index, you will see that that's been rising steadily all the way since 2009, 2010. So, so yeah, no happy answer to that question. I really don't think there's any major trigger out there that will take us revert that it'll make us revert back to more open economies of pre-Trump days. Next question, how do you see the complication of counties having to choose balanced countries, I suppose, uh, having to choose between the US and China playing to this reversion of a less protectionist world? Well, I don't think any Asian country is in a position to choose, given that for most of us, our largest trading partner is the US. Uh, is China, but for most of us, the largest amount of FDI comes from the US. So we rely on, with, on China for trade and US for investment. Uh, and then of course, many countries in Asia have strong military cooperation with both the US and China. Uh, some countries, the Navy has strong relationship with the US Navy. Some countries, the Army has strong relationship with the US Army. Um, so Asia's reliance and dependence on China and the US and substantial relationship with the U.S. remains very tight, uh, and Asia benefits tremendously from the U.S. security umbrella and its presence on the South China Sea. Uh, but of course, that comes with danger because China is pushing back on the U.S. presence there. But uh, but my main answer to that question is that the Asian countries are not in a position to choose. They live right next to China, so they cannot forsake China, and they value their exposure to the U.S. so much they're not going to value uh, give up on the U.S. either. So that's my answer to that question. 
that countries will not choose between the US and China. They'll try to keep their feet on both boats. What will the election results mean for Asia in terms of trade and supply chains? As you saw in the chart that I showed earlier, that FDI in Asia has not suffered, despite all the talk of supply chain fragmentation, trade wars, and so on. Similarly, capital market deal flows, uh, participation in China's local currency bond market, all those things continue apace, unabated, uh, notwithstanding all the pressure coming from the Trump administration. So I think that in terms of trade and supply chain, some companies are diversifying and hedging by building elsewhere. Some companies initially or inevitably will take some manufacturing out of China as it becomes a more expensive jurisdiction. Those are part of much longer term trends, have very little to do with Trump's trade war, and they will continue even with Biden as president. Next is an Indonesia question. Uh, is there any historical difference uh, between a Democrat win versus a Republican win as far as Indonesian assets are concerned or investment in Indonesia is concerned? Uh, I think that how much money flow into Indonesia has little to do with what's happening in the US election and more to do with what's happening on the streets of Indonesia. Uh, and if um, there are interesting prospects, money will come in. If there aren't, uh, they won't. Uh, but I don't think a Democrat-Republican win will necessarily change all that. Right now, Indonesia's headache is, number one, taking control of the pandemic. Number two, restoring livelihood without compromising health safety. Number three, go fund themselves for rainy days, something that they're doing quite well, in my view. Four would be, again, stabilize the rupiah and make sure that it doesn't become volatile uh, through series of you know, interventions and natural protection measures and so on. So short answer is no. Uh, not much difference. Which country do you think will be the biggest beneficiary of the election result? Well, if Biden wins, I think the market has already spoken, it will be China. If you look at Chinese stocks today, despite all the bad news coming from the Ann Financial IPO, they're shrugging that behind them and they're doing very well, uh, rising substantially in the last two trading sessions. So I think the market has spoken, the biggest beneficiary of a Biden presidency is China. Uh, conversely, if Trump were to pull out a surprise rabbit out of his hat and become president, uh, that would certainly cause sell-off in Chinese assets, in my view. Um, the country that might benefit beyond China if Trump were to get reelected um, is uh, India. Uh, Prime Minister Modi has developed a very strong relationship with President Trump, although Trump has been pretty tough on H-1B, a subject that is very close to Indian professionals. Uh, on the other hand, I think on military cooperation and a building some sort of a front against China, uh, India has been a very useful partner to the U.S. Um, so Trump presidency, India, Biden presidency, China. That's my answer to the question in terms of who's the, who's the potential biggest beneficiary. With Biden as president, but without the control of the Senate, how do you think his policies laid out beforehand will turn out and which industries do you think will be impacted the most? So I think this question I have already touched upon that you know, cutting corporate taxes in, or raising corporate taxes in a big way, um, pushing for, forward with the Green New Deal, initiatives like that will become very unlikely without the control of the Senate. Um, so, and the silver lining there is only the fact that even though right now there's very little support for the green industry from the center, America's states have moved on and they are doing good work in um, pushing for the green agenda without any help from the center. So that's the hope that we have large corporations have some sort of an enlightened approach toward that. Uh, do you think the trade war with China will subside? Will companies continue to have supply chain issues from China or will they stop? Um, I think the answer is yes and yes. Uh, I think that the trade war with China could very well subside even under Trump because he doesn't have that much to prove anymore and he does want some sort of a deal with China to simplify his views. Um, whereas in the case of Biden, I think he'll have to be a bit careful about not coming across as too sympathetic to the Wall Street and too against uh, companies. But at the same time, uh, I think it is likely to continue. Uh, it's not going to stop anytime soon. Uh, will companies continue to have supply chain shifts from China? Yes, of course they will. Uh, they have been doing it for decades. Uh, as garments uh, manufacturing became more expensive in China, a lot of the garments manufacturing went to India, Vietnam, and Bangladesh, and Bangladesh and Vietnam benefited from that tremendously with respect to jobs creation, women's employment, and so on. Um, the other thing is, you know, the sort of risk that uh, there won't be any extra support for the industry 
uh, and there will be a tech clash, uh, whether it's Google or social media companies. I think that issue is there, but would that necessarily mean that companies will move their supply chain out of China? Beyond the garments thing and maybe some very high tech and high, high, high end tech stuff, I don't really see it. Uh, and, and the reason for that is clear. Uh, at the very low end, high cost is an incentive to move the supply chain out of China. At the very top end, there are national security concerns, so you move it up. But in the mid end, China has such unparalleled logistics and uh, investment in infrastructure and uh, uh, use, uh, useful skill set among its workers that it's very, very hard to compete with China at that level. So I think that is the area where China will continue the corporate market, whether it is um, non-sensitive electronics or furniture or apparel, you know, they will still have a lot of uh, oomph coming out from Chinese companies. Next question. Uh, we don't see both Republicans and Democrats aligning their social coalitions. Uh, will the Biden administration provide any shift in trade policy in this region? So I think we've touched on this issue, but I think just point out that under a Biden presidency, certainly there'll be much more push for a rules-based approach, no capricious stuff. Uh, but at the same time, don't expect the Biden administration to cut tariff rates on TPP coverage issues um, uh, because uh, you know it's starting out so late, people are so distracted. Uh, so I wouldn't you know expect too much out of it. Uh, so trade-related matters uh, don't hold your breath, uh, and uh, trade policy in the region maybe down the road not top of the priority list. What's the outlook for impact by COVID-19 to our bank? Well, uh, Piyush Gupta will be hosting several DBS events in the coming days because of DBS's quarterly report. I think that question should be better answered by him, which I'm sure he'll be happy to do. Um, but from my perspective, a couple of things, uh, the COVID-19 has made us go even more digital with respect to not just remote working and collaboration, but uh, overall sort of, you know, day-to-day -day strategizing, meeting people for bigger plans, all of those things have been working pretty well. So that's been one impact of COVID that we have capitalized on. Um, but beyond that, you know, how long the economic downturn last is really the money question. Uh, the pandemic may have been high, but the economy comes back. We know how to learn with the virus and you know, we could have strong performances. Uh, and, and I think that is the view in the bank as well, that if we can provide series of alternative services to our clients who are struggling, uh, then uh, this pandemic will actually have come at a good time to engage those customers. Final question. What's the likely impact of a fintech expansion such as and financials IPO to our bank in the region? Well, first of all, it's not happening yet. Uh, there's been some late baking developments and Jack Ma's speech has been read very firmly by the Chinese intelligence and whether and financial, which of course, you know, Jack Ma owns a very large controlling stake and go ahead or not is a very big question. It's basically a cautionary tale with respect to Chinese governance and politics uh, and, and how to tread there on a very thin, thin line. So it's uh, almost 3.50 now. Uh, I think we are sort of done. Uh, I do not intend to make it a one hour call because we have some other activities in DBS this afternoon. So I will wrap it up here. Thanks to all of you who send these questions. Some of them are very thought provoking, really appreciated. It. it helps me in terms of my research as well. So I appreciate that very much. Our producer today was Martin Tucky. You can find references to our publications, live streams like this, podcasts and so on by Googling DBS Research Library. I thank you again for listening to our November live stream. We will see you with our annual outlook in December. Thank you very much. Have a great time. Be safe, everybody.